is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Magicians, season four, episode five, Escape from the Happy Place. In this episode, we spend a whole lot of time with Elliot this time around and find out exactly what it has been like for him in his mental prison. And truthfully, it hasn't been that bad. I can understand why he didn't really make an effort to leave until somebody explained to him that he should. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Nicole for commissioning this episode. Um, this episode was probably one of the most engrossing of the show so far. Like when it ended, I couldn't believe we had already reached like the time quota. You know, I was like, wait, what? It feels like it's been like 20 minutes. Um, I was just so like desperate to watch the next one right away. Actually, let me see when the next one is. Um, oh, there's a Killing Eve coming in, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, finally. I'm just getting very excited. Okay, 25th, next Wednesday. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to get to find out pretty soon. Yay! This was just so packed. Um, I'm really... Okay, I'm just going to start. <sighs> so, again, I want to mention, too, haven't seen Katie no idea what she's up to. So I, I'm, st I still have that question on my mind. Um, but we, we start off the episode in what looks like a flashback. And it's Elliot hosting a party with Margot, and the two of them are, commiserating on what an amazing party they are throwing and, you know, doing that thing where they kind of like flirt with each other and talking about how there's an orgy upstairs and yada, yada, yada. The only thing that's kind of marring how perfect this is, is a constant banging on the door. And Elliot keeps insisting that it's like, cops or a, just, just in general, somebody that they don't want there. I kind of thought it was going to be, uh, the, the monster itself or a different like version of Elliot trying to warn him. But it looks like, because when Margot answers it and she gets like pulled out, you know, I'm actually realizing, I don't know for sure what it was that was knocking. Was it the like monster like vulture type dealies or was it uh what's his name chauncey is that the guy's name he had a really funny name um whatever the case this like time together that he is having with margot and talking about what he loves about summer and generally having the ideal time it's a real shame that this is a prison. It's nice. You know, I understand that he wants to just enjoy himself because why wouldn't you? And we have him like meeting Todd and it's a really amazing moment because I don't know if this is part of a flashback. I think it is because of the way that everything is supposed to be like based in a memory, like his best memories. But he meets Todd and it turns out that Todd's real name is Elliot. And Elliot says, oh, yeah, no, no, no. That's not happening. You don't also get to be Elliot. What's your middle name? And that is what we wind up calling him from now on. I love it. I love it. His name, he wants to be Elliot so bad. And it turns out that he is named Elliot. I mean, I just kind of feel bad for the kid now. Jesus, no wonder, you know, 
man. It's just, and him like in this outfit, the way that Elliot dresses with this perfect cocktail in his hand, hanging out with Margot who has her fucking heels on and they are kicked up on the edge of this gorgeous armchair in front of the fire as she smokes a cigarette. The whole vibe of this is so like elevated. It's just, yeah, I wouldn't mind spending an afternoon like this. It's not my ideal scene, but it's pretty great. So Margot finally goes and answers the door. She says, no, you can't come in. I'm sorry, but that sounds like a you problem. And then somebody grabs her and yanks her out the door. And Elliot immediately pursues her out. And when he runs out, he doesn't run out of the physical kid's cottage. That's not where he is. He's running out of the break bills, like main building. And uh, there, this is when we meet uh, Chauncey. That's what I'm going to call him because I can't remember his name. And Margot has him in a headlock. I think that he was trying to grip up Margot, really underestimating whether or not she was going to be able to fight back. Um, and I love this moment of her just really looking like she could actually snap his neck if she wanted to. And this dude is saying we really need to get back inside. And the two of them are uh, looking around because they hear this sound. And it's a sort of screeching, like a pterodactyl kind of sound. And they all start running for the cottage. And then we pull back out again. And we are looking at the external Elliot and him talking to Quentin at the diner. We pick up pretty much right where we left off at the end of the last episode. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Sorry, guys. This like, I better not get that laryngitis again. I better fucking not. I swear to God, I will kill somebody. Um, so this moment is really interesting to me. The monster is saying, is this about your friend? Because that's not a problem. I'm your friend. He's gone. I'm here. Same number of friends. So, and then he pulls out this rock. I could not figure out what the hell it was supposed to be. And I found it extremely interesting that he pulls this out not because he's trying to be like, see, I'm finding pieces now, but to be like, hey, Quentin, what is this? He doesn't even know. This monster is out here murdering gods to reclaim parts, which we want, we wind up finding out later because of Julia. Likely these are parts that are meant to be put together to reform a body. But he doesn't know that yet. And there's something so sad and frustrating about the concept of him like pursuing something that is still an unknown quantity to him, that he is like so invested that he is willing to kill. And I mean, obviously killing isn't a big deal for him, but nevertheless, so invested and basically making it his mission and still just doesn't know what it is. I really thought once he got a piece of this thing, he he would start to remember, but no. And it doesn't even look like, it just looks like a rock here. It doesn't even look, because when he takes it out of the uh, body of Bacchus, Margot's crazy fairy eye can't even look at it. It's so bright. And... It doesn't give off any of that right now. Now, I guess that if Margot were here to look at this, it would. She'd be able to see it, even though it doesn't look like it's kind of active right now. But I suspect that when he pulled it out of Bacchus, it still had some sort of energy because of it having been in like a living body that it maybe doesn't have now for whatever reason. Um, but yeah. Quentin's looking at it and he says that it's the beginning of civilization old. I don't know how he can tell that, but uh, the monster asks, and where was that? And Quentin says, well, Mesopotamia was the very first. And the monster says, 
oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. I'll see you back at the apartment. And then he teleports the hell out of there. I have to imagine that for Quentin, it's such a relief every time this thing goes somewhere else. You know, like, I mean, it's just got to be like the the one nice break in the day for him when he gets to do his own thing. Um. So then we go back into Elliot's mind and he is Charlton. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Charlton, what a fucking name. So he is explaining to Elliot about the fact that none of this is actually real. There's a monster possessing you and inhabiting your body. Normally he tears people to shreds. So this is preferable. And he thrust all of you to this nook of your mind that holds all of your best remembrances, even your friend. And he says to Elliot to imagine that Margot's not here. And he does. And he opens his eyes and she's gone. And he's just like, oh, fuck. Okay. I really like that this show doesn't spend too much time of, with this guy trying to convince Elliot. Elliot gets it right away. And that feels really believable to me because like they're, they're fucking magicians, you know, like it's, they've been through really weird mental blocks and prisons before. If it took too much to convince him, it would be annoying. But I like the fact that it's just like one moment like that. And he's like, oh shit. Okay. It's fine. Uh, Charlton doesn't know how to use the word fuck, which I just find precious and really funny. Um, but that comes up over and over again throughout this episode. And he says to Elliot that he has met him before. And Elliot's like, no, 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 I definitely don't remember a Charlton. And this guy is like, oh, well, <laughs> I didn't exactly introduce myself. But uh, the monster possessed my body too. And Elliot says, well, I did shoot your body, so I guess that's what it was. And Charlton says, it was the monster's longer than it was mine. And I enjoy the change of scenery. So here's my question. Is Charlton in Elliot's mind because Elliot was the one to kill Charlton? Because there's other people that it has possessed, I would assume. And none of them are here. I don't know. Um, but the idea that you could be possessed by this monster for longer than you actually got to live in that body yourself just seems really mean. And I hate it. Like, Jesus, that's awful. Um, so yeah. He explains to Elliot about the happy place. It's very easy to get content and lose track of time and reality. And Elliot's like, oh, okay, cool. So you're here to break me out. And Charlton says, well, absolutely fucking not. We, <laughs> we can't go out there. This is the only place that the creatures can't come. And I'm like, why can't you just tell him from the beginning this moment of this is the only place the creatures can't come. he doesn't know what you're talking about yet yeah he heard shrieking but you're not explaining things i hate when people do it like this okay anyway um he says that these are the monsters other hosts inmates from the castle horrible wretched mistakes of the gods all of them and elliot's like well if this is all memory they can't hear us or and and they can't hurt us right and he says, tell that to Aura. She was here before you. You can't. She's dead. Dead fuck. <laughs> Guys, Charlton just trying out the word fuck throughout this episode in different places. Something I didn't know I needed because fuck is a really weird word. You know, like, and honestly, dead fuck doesn't entirely not work like if he said she's a dead fuck that's fine it's just that he just says dead fuck if he said fucking dead that's fine too it's very close 
but just not quite right. And I love it. Um, so he says, I told her that when you die here, you're gone forever, but she just had to try and find her door and pray. Imagine what befell her devoured by creatures, flesh rent from her bones, skin torn from her skull. She died staring at her own face held before her, which is really, I think for some reason, the real, like for me, something that gets to me is like face stuff because it's part of like who you are, you know, your identity is wrapped around what you look like. And the idea of somebody like taking a piece of you to make it so that other people might not even be able to identify you is so freaky. And also like your face is really fucking sensitive, right? So like that, the pain of that feels like it would be so much more acute. Um, there is, if those of you who have seen Birds of Prey know that there is a face peeler in that. And it really fucked me up. Didn't care for it. Um, so this is when Elliot zeroes in on, wait a minute, did you just say there's a door? And we wind up finding out a little bit later uh, that the door is in like your worst traumas. It's in moments that are either hugely embarrassing or full of regret and what comes with that is really, really interesting. And we will definitely talk about it. But first, we're going to jump over to Alice. Now, last week, I got spoiled on what happens with Alice. Um, the good thing is, I don't really care about Alice's story. And it was not like, it wasn't that heartbreaking to me. Because this was like, if you're going to spoil me on anything, that is the one that I care the least about. So it worked out. Hugabug's here. Hugabug's so sorry. It's okay. Um, and it winds up like being pretty close to the beginning of this episode. So it was also like, it tur turned out to not be like a huge uh, twist of the whole episode. This is just the beginning of Alice's story in this episode. But to summarize, she is supposed to be uh, leading... Um, plover to one of the fountains and i i don't remember she wants to bring him somewhere like peaceful um or that's what he wants her to do and she winds up bringing him over to the poison room and she says to him when he like notices that the the fountain is locked and that that's pretty unusual and he starts to like ask questions she says something like, don't you trust the book? I don't know how she convinces him that it says that in the book. I don't know if it's just that he trusts her so much that he doesn't even look at the book. Um, but, oh yeah, here it is. I see now. She like moves the dot with magic. That's right. Because it's like glowing on the page. That's right. Um, and she... Lock, like unlocks it, drops him in there, pulls the rope back so that he can't come back out again, and then leaves him there. I assume Plover is dead because the poison room kills you pretty fucking quick. I will say, however, if Plover turns out to be not dead, I won't be that surprised because that's just the way of television. If you don't actually see the body, you don't know anything. And on this show, seeing the body isn't even necessarily anything. So I'm fine with this being the last we ever see of Plover. That'd be no problem for me. I didn't really need him to come back at all. But this is uh, kind of, in my mind, left a little bit open-ended. And Alice is like really feeling that what she did is justified because Plover is a child molester, a terrible person, he wound up like being a direct cause of the beast, which killed tons of people. And um, everything involved with the beast wound up resulting in the loss of magic and, you know, all of this. So she feels like it's justified. Not only that, though, Alice wants redemption. And she is hoping that by punishing somebody who is terrible, that it will somehow work in her favor. Like there's a point system. And 
there's this sort of expectation that like if she evens out the score of somebody negative that she'll like get those points for herself. It's a very Alice looks at the world in the way I feel a lot of men I've met look at the world. And I say men because I feel like women are expected to do more. Just in general, in the world, we are expected to be more. We are meant to be um, caretakers, whether that is in the form of being a mother or whether it's simply in the form of being a wife who cares for her husband. And yeah, I'm going to like, this is all heteronormative, like cis normative, toxic shit that I'm describing here. We are expected to, uh, especially nowadays, like not only help provide for a household, but also like manage it and maintain it. And we are also meant to be like a support system for our husbands in a mental health sort of way. And this leads to a lot of resentment that women can't quite put their finger on because they don't have the vocabulary for it. It's a huge part of why my first marriage ended. And men from the few long-term relationships that I have had often see things in a, a sort of a points system. And they have a very skewed idea of what is worth what points. So... For example, many women will talk about how men who do something they do every day, like load the dishwasher, expect a fucking parade in response to the fact that they loaded the dishwasher or that they vacuumed. They think it's worth many more points when they do it than it is when their wife does it all the fucking time. And they put those in their column, whereas the, they, they get five points for that. The wife gets one point for that. Similarly, they believe that their income and being a provider for the household is somehow worth a lot more because their egos are very attached to that role a lot of the time. And th in conversation, the point system is very much in effect where if I say something wrong as a dude, I lose points. But I think I can go out and buy you a present. And that present, I lost five points with saying this thoughtless thing, but this present is worth 10. So I'll bring this home and it will not only make up for the shitty thing I said, but I will now be in the plus again. And that will mean that I get to do another shitty thing later because I've built up like points for myself. I've banked them that I can then fall back on. It's sort of reminiscent of like the idea of sin and how like if you like preemptively uh, say enough Hail Marys that you can go out and like do whatever sin you want. This is not on obviously like a sanctioned thing, but there are people who like sort of think of it that way that like, if I ask forgiveness first, I can go ahead with it. And that mental, like I've actually, it took me a long time to realize that that point system was what was like fucking up conversations where I was like, you really fucked this up. Why do you think doing going out and buying me something is erasing that? I don't understand what this even is related to in your mind that you would think this makes up for that. You said a really hurtful thing. I don't care that you bought me this like appliance that I wanted. I don't want that. I want you to know that you did something terrible and to fucking apologize and not do it again. And when I really got to the heart of it, it was something like this, where Alice is like thinking that she's like negative 100, but Plover is so terrible that he is like negative 500 because he victimized a child, but she at least didn't do that. So if she punishes Plover, that negative 500 gets brought even, and maybe she'll get like, what, half of that? 250. 
Now she's ahead 150 points. Maybe it's fine now. Maybe she made up for everything just by this one act. She really, it's a weird thing because it's like she knows that's not how it works and that's not true, but she kind of does still. And with somebody who's that sort of logical and tends to be a little bit too much in her head, it makes a, a lot of sense why she would want to be able to quantify redemption and goodness in this way. It really does make a lot of sense. You know, it's just like, that, that ain't how it works, kid. Um, if it were, God, it would, everything would be a lot simpler and it would be nicer, but that's just not how it works. So yeah, she spends a bunch of time later when she finally like gets in touch with Quentin trying to gauge whether or not she has done enough for him to like, I don't know if it's take her back exactly. There is a feel there and it seems like Quentin thinks that's what she's trying to do. I'm not even convinced that's exactly it, but it's the best way to say it. Um, and understandably, in Quentin's estimation, what Alice did was just straight up unforgivable. And he's basically like, you can help. You can come in here and like, give us your assistance and do, you know, but whatever you do to help, that's not a check in the pro column. That's not helping you. That's you just doing this because it's the right thing to do, but it is not gaining you any traction with me. And you need to know it won't. And you can pick up all kinds of wild, over the top, like sacrifices and say, well, what about this? And none of them is going to make up for the way this went down. And I respect that, you know, like it shouldn't. And I'm not mad at him for having reached this place where he's just like, no, I struggled so long to try and like bring you back to yourself and wanting you to be who you used to be and, you know, obsessing over how I had loved you. And I am just really realizing like, you're not who you were. And I kept being told that, but I just never really got it. I never believed it until I saw what you did. And now I am sure you are not the person you were. And as far as I am concerned, the Alice that I cared about is dead and you're just a totally someone else with her face. And uh, yeah, it's about time. You know, I had been really tired of Quentin obsessing over bringing Alice back. And I'm not sure. I, I don't think that the show is just going to have Alice obsessed with Quentin now that I don't, I hope that they don't just reverse it and think that that's interesting. But Alice struggling for redemption and trying to figure out what that means and how she can get it, that's interesting. Because redemption is, it's a tricky thing. And especially because Alice has done some terrible things that we don't even know about, you know? I mean, her betraying the crew is just one of a bunch of stuff that she did as a Niffin. And we do see that, like, when she kills the... uh what is that thing that she was like, that was possessing people? There's still that streak in her of being like a little bit cruel for the fun of it. It's not completely gone. And, you know, she had tortured these things to death just because it was pretty to watch. And she had no idea, or we have no idea what other things she has tortured just for the, the fun of it. There's no, you know, we don't know. So the lamprey. Thank you, Austin. Um, I'm really, this is just a question that comes up a lot these days, especially like Rashawn and I talked about this um, on, I think it was in a Harry Potter episode where we were talking about Snape and how a lot of people sort of consider Snape's sacrifice to be like making up for everything. And we don't think it does. And in this day and age, when celebrities have a lot more FaceTime, in a way, with their fans because of social media, because of like lots more interviews that happen and, you know, YouTube videos and having their own Instagram accounts where they can post stuff. 
there's a lot and and also combined with that all of their fans having more access to them and to social media that can be seen things that celebrities have done that are despicable come to light in a way that they never used to be it never used to be possible you know which has resulted in a much bigger culture of falling off of uh pedestals we are really starting it's starting to be hammered home to us that no matter how great a person is a pedestal is just not a good idea no matter how good they are there's going to be something that disappoints you depending on who they are it's various levels of disappointment and some of them can be outright horror and for all of us it depends on who we are what we're willing to forgive and look past and what we think is forgivable and not so chris brown beating the hell out of rihanna for a lot of people that was like yeah okay i'm done with you that was horrifying and i'm done but not everybody, not even close to everybody. And what could he possibly do to repair that damage? There's not a lot that I can think of, but it doesn't feel like he's even interested in repairing that damage either. There was a whole controversy recently with like Michael Vick and the fact that people feel what he did was unforgivable. And, you know, the question then he went to prison he has gone t through counseling and has contributed a lot to charities and has generally seemed to really make an effort to turn his life all the way around what does it take for us to feel somebody has atoned i it, it's not going to look the same for everybody and alice is out here trying to find an external measure and it's not about that. She thinks it is because she wants somebody to tell her, okay, you're good enough now. And I think that the thing is, if she even got that, it wouldn't work the way she seems to think it would to hear. You know, it's like, I'm sure that you guys have experienced this where you want the approval of somebody so bad and want to hear them say that you're doing a good job so bad and then you actually get them to say it and it just is hollow by the time you get it. You thought this was going to mean everything to you. And it turns out once they say it, you still don't believe it. And you're just like, wait, I thought this was going to make me feel better. I still feel really shitty and I don't actually believe you. And now I'm realizing I need to get that feeling that I'm good enough from myself. And that's way worse, right? Because like, Making getting to a point where you yourself feel worthy is so much harder than convincing somebody outside of your head that you're doing what you should be doing. So where we're at now with Alice, I find this potentially interesting and we will see. Um, so then we have Quentin and he is talking to Julia and Shoshana. And I said last episode, I really hope that Shoshana is not just, a, you know, another red shirt who's going to be killed unceremoniously. Well, she is. I don't even know if I said I hope she's not. I said, I just, I wonder if she is. And that is exactly what. She winds up sacrificing herself in order to save Julia. And uh, Shoshana is really a sweetie. And I feel bad that she's gone. But it was a weird thing to just have somebody hanging around Julia who like worshipped her. So I'm not entirely bummed out that that has been taken out of the equation. So they are talking about figuring out exactly what it is that they can do to take down this monster and Quentin basically reassures Julia that as far as he is concerned, Penny is dead because he believes what the monster told him. And 
this winds up, you know, being a totally different story very shortly. But at this time, he's essentially agreeing that we can kill the vessel and it's not, I'm not going to fight you on this. Um, so then we have Penny and he's sitting on a park bench. I'm real curious what the deal is with him sitting just out here. Like he's just sitting, he's not doing anything. And this kid comes and sits down next to him and is like, Penny, right? And Penny turns to him and says, do I know you? And the dude leans over and jabs a fucking syringe into Penny's neck. Uh, no, I don't like that at all. Thank you. No. So we cut from there to Elliot's greatest trauma. And this is, it's what's really interesting is that he thinks this is his greatest trauma. And like, maybe it is in its way. It turns out to not exactly be what we're looking for. But isn't that something when, when somebody asks you a question about like, what is one of your worst memories or something that's like really painful to you that you can think you're answering in a completely sincere way. You really believe you're telling the truth and it's just not quite really. And how much you have to sort of push through and find out the answer to that. Um, it turns out that there was this bully Logan and he accidentally uses his magic to kill this bully. And it's the first time that he's ever really, I think like used his magic in that. Like I, I get the feeling that it was sort of like a Harry Potter, like burst of reaction rather than something that he necessarily like premeditated. Um, I love Charlton's reaction to saying, he says something like that is very fuck. Ah, oh, bless him. Um, but he says, he explains about the fact that Logan was the bu a bully who drove him to thinking about killing himself many times. And when I did this, I became the worst person in my life. And I don't like, it's one of those things where I, I can't tell. Like he says, when I became the worst person that makes me feel like it had to be premeditated because otherwise it's not really his fault unless he knows that in that moment he was choosing something. It's hard to say, but he's really blaming himself for this. And I'm like, I'm having a hard time holding it against him, to be honest. Um, Charlton says, is there anything particularly painful that you are avoiding about this? Because apparently you this isn't it. I don't see the door. You have a friend here to comfort you. And then this is the part where I got really like choked up guys. So this kid Taylor comes up to him and he says, everyone else would taunt and bully me, but never Taylor. And then all of a sudden Elliot's face falls and he goes, Oh shit. I know where we need to go. And they, the, his acting guys in this scene, they're walking into the gymnasium and you can hear the bullying. You can hear the fight. You can hear somebody being beat up. Some, somebody saying you can kick him harder than that. And the camera has not shown us this yet. We just see this entrance and Elliot kind of looks at Charlton in this way. Like I really hate that you're about to see this. It's a deep shame, like the kind of shame that you as a person push this memory out of your head and pretend never happened in order to get on with your life because the guilt otherwise would just eat you alive. And this, like, there is, 
in the um, Patrons Mighty Network right now, I posted a thing that has a list of objects that you can choose between to, like, you know, each representing one of the seven deadly sins that all have these amazing powers. And, and what would you choose? And a lot of people picked the Ring of Pride. I am shocked by this because the first part of the description of the Ring of Pride is bringing back memories that have been repressed. Why would anybody want to agree to that? Guys, like there's a reason they're repressed so that you can fucking live your life. And it, it, it specifically says bringing them back in perfect clarity, like so that you can. It, it For me, that sounds like a fucking straight up nightmare. I mean, no, Austin's out here saying the benefits outweigh that. Uh, uh Sorry, no, totally disagree. And maybe it depends on who you are as a person and the things that you have done. That could be it. Maybe it's some of you. It would outweigh them because you are better people. But. I would rather die. Absolutely not. And this moment with him coming in here and you see this kid on the floor, his back is to you. He's being beaten up. This coach comes in and just says, all right, that's enough. He gets the point. He doesn't even fucking punish them. He's fine with this. And when he blows the whistle, Elliot kind of like tenses up. And there's a real feel here of like that whistle meant something to him, too. And this coach meant something to him, too. It's a it's a nice little like nod to the fact that probably there were a lot of people bullying Elliot in his life, and some of them were not children. And it gives the reason for him doing this a lot more dimension. Everybody walks away and leaves this kid on the ground, except for one kid who goes up to him and kicks him in the gut. And... The coach says, Elliot, that's enough. And you see the look on Charlton's face as he realizes, like, what exactly this is here, because he, of course, thought this was Elliot on the ground. And you can see Elliot looks like he kind of wants to throw up, like watching this memory is a bad thing. And he says, hating myself for who I am is one thing, but to hurt somebody else yeah. And that is when these shrieking things appear. They're looking around for a door, thinking they found the spot. Apparently they haven't. Everything starts to go dark and these things appear behind them. And it's pretty like the the design of them is really unnerving because they are just kind of weird, uh, like cosplays. And it's sort of like lo-fi but for some reason that really works for me here it doesn't have to like i feel like doing something cgi would have been not right it wouldn't have worked the same way there's something about these things being practical that fucks me up so this coach just goes up to them and it's a weird thing in this memory of him sort of not seeing that these are like out of place and he just tells them like that they aren't supposed to be on campus. And one of them just like basically slashes the coach to shreds. And again, there's a, a like a part of me that wonders. I mean, I know that it's the coach that got in their face and like tried to stop them. But also, Elliot, I get the feeling really hated that coach. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was a little piece of him that was like, go after him. It's fine. I would, I, you know, I wouldn't be mad at him for that. It's just a memory, whatever. Um, so Julia, she had this moment where she was working with Shoshona and it's really funny guys because Penny, I guess he was sitting on that park bench because he just got kicked out of Julia's place. He comes to try and like help and he really doesn't have much to contribute here. And Julia gets visited by Iris, um, who is the goddess. And she says, the monster you let out of the castle is after me and my friends. And she says, you have to trap them, trap him. 
I and Julia's like, you need to tell me what I am because I'm not a human and I'm not a god. So what the fuck is going on? And Iris says, you are the worst parts of both. You're helpless as a human, but you are also immortal as a god. So everyone you ever love will die. And you're just going to be stuck here on this stupid rock alone forever. Because no one can kill you except for, oh, hey, someone exactly like me. And she tells her, she hands her a bag and says, this is the living stone. And black spires made of thousands of these. It keeps this thing from teleporting. And that's what makes black spire such a perfect prison. Um, the blood in it can hold him in place for a few minutes. So bleed the stone, dump the blood on him. I'll take him to the castle. And Julia says, well, I don't get it. Why don't you just do it? And she says, gods can't touch the blood. It fritzes our powers. Not that that's a problem for you. So once you do the blood, I'll do the rest and please don't you do your usual thing and screw this up. And then she disappears. So I love the fact that because this all happens, by the way, because she had this cloaking spell on her that Shoshona lifts without realizing that she's doing anything wrong. And it comes back down at the end of this conversation. And Shoshona clearly did not see Iris. She's not aware any of this happened. Um so when we come back to Quentin and Julia, they are trying to bleed this stone, but it's just like a single drop coming out of it. Like it's, it, you know, it's supposed to be a much like th this jar is probably supposed to be close to full and this will take ages to, to bleed. And this is what winds up requiring Alice's help. Um, the creature shows up, the monster, in the middle of this conversation and tells them fantastic news. Um, and I love the fact that they're like having to cover up what they're doing because they were in the middle of just bleeding this rock right on the counter when he popped up. He says, fantastic news. Look what I found. And he holds out another one of these like stones um, I think it's the same one, right? And he says, I went to Mesopotamia like you told me to. And it's really quite different than I remember. I couldn't find anything useful. I got so frustrated, I almost broke it. But when I pick it up and focus my power into it, this happens. And we see all of these like writings like scratched into the surface of it, like all of these symbols. And Julia is like, why don't we go to the library at break bills and figure out the, the answer to this question? Obviously trying to find a reason to get this creature out of the fucking kitchen so that Quentin can continue on with his uh, bleeding of the stone. But Shoshona, bless her heart, does not realize that this is meant to be a stalling tactic. And so sweet angel that she is almost immediately finds the answer to their problem, which I'm just like, Oh girl, read the room. But she is not thinking this way. Um, there is, uh, I, I'm going to, to, I want to wrap up on this. You know, what? I'm going to dodge out of here for a second and talk about Margot and what's going on with Margot here, because she winds up having to tell Fen about Elliot. And as far as Margot is concerned, I guess she's also treating this whole thing like Elliot is dead. And that is definitely how Fen is reacting. So at another point, Margot goes and gets her, uh, her birthright box. And she is trying to find um, like a way to open it because evidently there's like a trick to it or something, I think. And she walks into the room and there is a pile of clothing and Fen just s sits up from within this and her, her face is all streaked because she's been crying. And it says, the last lay, the widow lays 
in her lover's bed buried in his garments. Um, and she says, I was worried you weren't at the bare breasted laments. There's all kinds of things that wind up being dropped throughout this episode about the different like rituals that they do and like the altar of remembrance. And it is really, really funny. I loved this as like a reoccurring joke. It was just, it got progressively like more and more ridiculous. Um, so yeah, she's, uh, says, can we get the locksmith up in here? And, um, she says, everybody is gone for the day, except for the carpenters building the altar of remembrance. Yep. I actually got that right. That's funny. So Margot dodges the hell out of there. And then when we come back a little bit later, um, Ooh, guys, do you hear my stomach? It just made this like not so sound. Um, when we come back a little bit later, she is <laughs> getting the carpenters to work on this and trying to pop it open. Um, and Fen says, are you okay? You haven't cried yet. And Margot says, I can't cry out all the sadness ever because once I do, once I start, I'll never stop. Do you understand? It'll, I will be useless forever. So as somebody who has to rule this kingdom, I will be goddamned if I drop the ball because I was too busy crying with my tits out. This is probably the hardest I've ever related to Margot. I have a very difficult time just letting go because I always feel that I will spiral and never come back from it. I used to have a hard time just crying. And since my father died, crying has come a lot more easily and I cry all the time. But I don't do the like full on let go easily at all. And I know it's like probably unhealthy, but I am afraid of it. Genuinely afraid of what will happen. You know, there have been... <laughs> so I guess I just have this thing with losing my voice. It's like a recurring thing in my life. Um, but there was a time where I was doing this like group therapy thing where you were meant to like scream out your frustrations. And I have a scream that is just too loud to be screamed indoors. It's just not like I wasn't going to do it. So my the person who was like running this like session was like, well, go outside and we were in a really wooded area and she was like, go out into the woods and scream out there. And uh, I did. I walked a ways too. And I screamed and then turned and walked all the way back. And when I came in, everybody was just still and staring at me. And somebody was like, if I ever get mugged, I want to be with you. Apparently, it was loud enough, even as far away as I went, that it kind of freaked them out. And after that, I couldn't speak for four days because that huge scream that I let out ripped my throat up, apparently, and I couldn't talk after that for a while. And that's a really good metaphor for how I feel about about letting my emotions out in general. They're too big. I can't do that. If I were to be on vacation and knew that I could be useless for several days after, maybe. But I have work to do. I have a life. And I can't just collapse. I can't do that. And most people can't do that. I'm way too practical to let this stuff take precedence. And I'm not trying to like shit on anybody who does let themselves collapse at the expense of practical things. Maybe that's healthier. It could be. Who's, who am I to say? But I am not willing to make that trade off. And I'm not mad at Margot for this. It makes 
so much sense to me, like so deeply in my soul. I understood exactly what she meant here. Um, so, okay, let's go back to what's happening with Elliot, because this is a really moving thing. Elliot in his brain remembers something like we have this amazing, like scenes of him going to all of the things that like embarrassed him throughout his life. Um, Not being able to get it up was frequently a thing. Um, Sleeping with uh, Quentin and Margot was one of the sleeping with people's boyfriends, all of these different guys. It's really amazing. There's like a several haircuts that are, Listed behind him, dad's heart attack, camping, dog incident number two. Um, All of the times that he has let his friends down, things like this. And eventually he remembers the this moment that we didn't even get to see between him and Quentin. And it is when they remember their life when they put together the mosaic and Quentin is really moved by this realization that they were good together and basically tries to be like, what if we do this? What if we give it a shot? I mean, there's no time I think in anyone's life where they get to see how well things could have worked for them. Like we get to see in this situation and Elliot kind of pushes him away and says, this isn't who I am. You know that this was like a particular situation that we were put in, but it's not, he says, we were injected with a half century of emotion. And I don't think that you're thinking clearly. And it's a a really beautiful, it's Elliot watching this and watching himself say no and getting so pissed at himself. Just like, what are you doing, dude? Seriously. And that, he, this this is just a really beautiful to me representation of of regret of there are actions like what he did as a child that in a lot of ways we can excuse because he was a kid figuring things out self-loathing trying to like you know it was horrible and his shame around it is very real and i understand it but this it was like he like knew as he was doing it And he hurt somebody who was like opening up to him and who he cared about. And yeah, he just says to himself, what the hell are you doing? Alice, meanwhile, has bled this rock and she has read Q's book. So she knows exactly how this all went down. And the way she convinces Quentin to let her help is by explaining to him, you will die if I don't, and here's how, and explains to him the exact details of it. So she convinces him to let her help and then is reciting the different details from that when she is with him in the scene of like this dog and getting distracted by it. And then the, uh, the monster comes and kills you. They're in the middle of this and the monster is coming at him, but Elliot inside of his mind goes up to memory Quentin and kisses him and is basically like, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to try and be brave the way that you have taught me to be brave. And the monster is coming at Quentin looking as the monster does. And then all of a sudden in Elliot's mind, a door appears And he goes to it and is able to get out just long enough to say to Quentin the exact line that Quentin said to him 
when do we get proof of concept like this? And then peaches and plums, motherfucker. And it's funny because I think I told you guys, Jesse is in the chat, I think, right? Jesse, I think, sent me the peaches and plums notebook, which I have been keeping right here to be able to show you guys for like weeks. And I straight up, it's not there. And I don't, oh, here it is. Hold on. Ha ha. Isn't this cute? And I didn't like as much as I loved that portion of the story. I was surprised that it was like it took people's uh, imagination so much that they decided to like make it a thing. But now I get it. Now I get the significance of this line, Peaches and Plums being like a, just it's a signal between the two of them. And it represents him trying to be vulnerable and like be with somebody. And it's just a, there's a lot more to it. So thank you for that, Jesse. I believe that you are the one who sent it to me. Um, so as soon as Quentin realizes that Elliot is really in there, because of course, at first, he doesn't believe it. It's not until he says those words that he gets it. Uh, he pulls the monster out of the way so that Alice can't get him with this like blood, this rock blood. And the goddess turns up Iris and manages to try to kill uh, I she tries to kill Julia in retribution kills Shoshona instead and as she is distracted with all of that she is killed in turn by the monster and this winds up being a huge boon because they can they are able to turn the situation around and convince the monster that they did this on purpose to help him and that they couldn't tell him about the plan because Iris was watching the whole time and they couldn't do that. It's genius. Qu Qu Quentin really thinks on his feet here. I really appreciate the way that everybody manages to like figure out what he's doing and play along right away. Poor Julia is like trying to not shake and is trying to hold tears back as she's like, yeah, this totally went exactly how we wanted and has this paper and uh, is explaining to them, to, to the monster about like, I think this is meant to put together a body. And they realize that if they can put together a body, maybe they would be able to get Elliot back. And that maybe their their initial lie about trying to help should be what they are doing. And it's a pretty intense ending, like of just, you know, um, so then we go to the conversation between Alice and Quentin um, at the end of the episode and him just basically being like, I'm sorry, but Alice, you aren't welcome back in my life anymore. I appreciate your help and we needed it, but this is it and we're done. And she walks out of there and we know that there's like this, it also adds all these layers to uh, Quentin's concern for Elliot because up till now it's just been like oh he's his good friend but now I'm realizing like he might just low-key be in love with Elliot and that's like you know he's going through a similar thing as with Alice now um so yeah it was just a really intense ending I really like this episode a lot I really really did so I'm fascinated to see what comes next next week guys next week um, all right, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you all again so much for listening and for coming and hanging out in the chats. Um, thank you to Nicole again for commissioning this episode. And I will be seeing you all on Wednesday with a new one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.